All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Mike McCoy. I'm the chair of the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group, and we are having another general meeting session today. Uh, first and foremost, as always, uh, please, we have a don't be a jerk rule here. Uh, we want to be able to have a space for open ideas, open collaboration, and uh, different perspectives and experiences when it comes to blockchain, when it comes to the technology used in healthcare and life science settings. So please, uh, when you're joining these meetings, uh, please do not down anyone. Please do not uh, uh, disrespect anyone for their ideas or their questions, uh, as well as do not disclose anything that is under NDA or that is uh, proprietary to your business or other business avenues you're affiliated with. Uh, so don't be a jerk and don't share anything that uh, can be publicly accessible. So I uh, want to give space for uh, there's everyone here has been introduced uh, to each other in the group so far. Uh, but I want to give time for Guillermo Diaz, who's uh, based in Latin America, to be able to uh, talk about some new opportunities he's looking within the blockchain healthcare space. Uh, he's primarily looking for opportunities in Latin America, but if uh, if you have opportunities that, or know of people in his either region, area, or that could use his expertise, uh, please feel free to reach out to him. But Guillermo, please tell us exactly what type of employment or what type of roles you're looking for. Hi, Mike. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. And I'm sorry, I'm just telecommuting also in, in, into the streets. So uh, basically what I'm looking for is just to apply my knowledge into the blockchain arena, but uh, specifically try to make business here down in Mexico. I believe that uh, we have a lot of potential in terms of uh, solutions around blockchain. Actually, I'm developing uh, with some folks in the US some uh, solutions around healthcare. I would like to have the opportunity in the uh, next sessions to explain what are the challenges here down in Mexico and how we can apply blockchain because Mexico is a very specific uh, country. We have uh, 42 trade agreements with several countries and that's uh, an amazing opportunity to create some business here down in, in, into the several uh, projects, industries, etc. So basically, to be more specific, is that uh, I'm looking uh, to create that kind of a scenario where blockchain can help uh, governments, industries. I'm part of uh, several. Uh, non-profit organizations who are related to IT. So this is the opportunity to uh, create uh, some business with the, the uh, global uh, IT companies who has presence here down in Mexico. And of course, my challenge and my duties right now are to adopt blockchain solutions here in my country. So thank you, thank you, uh, Mike, for the opportunity to explain what we can do here down in Mexico. Awesome, so I know Guillermo was very active on LinkedIn and, and can be able to answer messages there, but uh, if there's an email or preferred way you uh, would like to be contacted by Guillermo, feel free to insert that into the chat. And so anyone can be able to copy it and, and message you offline. So <clears throat> whenever you have the time through the busy streets. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I will put my LinkedIn uh, and my uh, contact information here in the chat. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Are there any other announcements or community announcements that uh, anyone else would like to make? Cool. Awesome. We'll move on. Uh, I wanted to showcase some of the upcoming events and, and presentations that are coming on in the world of blockchain, especially in Hyperledger. Uh, ones that I added on from last week are the Blockchain Expo in North America. Uh, it's having some healthcare topics as well. Uh, the University of Arkansas is also uh, having a Blockchain for Business Conference. A lot of their work and research 
uh, at the University of Arkansas is tied to blockchain at Walmart, blockchain solutions at Walmart, as well as um, at Walmart in particular, they are looking to use blockchain for some healthcare supply chain use cases such as tracking pharmaceuticals and other things like that. I know they've had conversations and have published some literature about that. And um, there will be some presentations along those lines uh, for this session on October 8th. And then there is a blockchain and healthcare world summit, mostly based for our European and APAC fans uh, around the world. Uh, it starts at 5.30 Eastern time for American time, but uh, feel free to join on to that event as well. Uh, there's some in the chat, awesome, uh, cool. And then, um, Mike? yeah, Wendy. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, about the University of Arkansas event, I will be speaking at that event about governance strategies for enterprises for health-related blockchains. Um, Mary Lassity invited me. I'm really honored because I, I really respect her work. So uh, yes, I absolutely encourage you to come, bring your questions. The goal is for us to have a true discussion and be able to share our experiences in a meaningful way. Thanks. That's really cool. Awesome. Glad to know Wendy's a part of it too. So. Uh, any questions on the events and presentations coming up, or does anyone have another event or presentation? Yeah, I, I have missed? another one. Yeah. I, I um, I'd love to invite you to the Government Blockchain Healthcare Working Group uh, Healthcare Town Hall tomorrow. When I get into the office, I'll I'll put the link in the chat. Oh, we it's luckily a, have that on here. GBA oh, okay. Blockchain Healthcare Roundtable. Yeah, Thursday at yeah. Yes, I will be presenting with my colleague Aaron Cohn tomorrow, and our focus is. Uh, addressing myths and misunderstandings about blockchain and healthcare. A big part of the focus is that organizations, so the healthcare community doesn't necessarily understand blockchain. So part of it is to get them to think differently about what the possibilities are for utilization of distributed ledger technologies in their environment and help them understand how it fits into their ecosystem. The other part of the uh, audience will be blockchain developers and um, those interested in emerging into healthcare and helping them understand that in order to create a viable product for the healthcare space, that you have to build the technical safeguards into the technology itself, and that you have to have tremendous uh, documentation of all of your procedures. I'm gonna be doing probably the deepest dive into um, my work in life sciences and the regulatory compliance issues. And I am just gonna put lots of lots of pieces on the table. The goal is to just create a, a, a deep dialogue and get both sides of the community to engage with each other with questions. And hopefully we can just ele elevate the amount of knowledge in, the, in these areas. So um, yeah, when I get to the office, I'll, I'll put the link, if it's not already there, into the chat. And I would just love it if you could contribute some of your experience too. So thanks. Awesome, thank you, Wendy. Moving on to industry news, research, uh, and group action items. I should put another comma there, but English is hard. So uh, <laughs> Global Blockchain uh, Initiative released a paper called titled Digitizing Healthcare, Risk and Opportunity of Blockchain in the Healthcare System. I'm going to open up the link to that. I found this one fairly interesting. Uh, the best way to access it I found was on LinkedIn. They had their own page for it, but then you had to download the report and that was just annoying. So um, I figured the best way to do it were to take it on this page um, and then to go to the full screen so we could be able to see it. First off was anyone else, can you see the screen by the way? Awesome. Was anyone able to take a look at this report? I read the abstract and I downloaded the full thing, but I, I was just, it's the one thing you posted that I didn't get to read. <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, some of the things that, that came out from uh, 
the dangers were uh, transactions stored in blocks that are cryptographically secured. Uh, one of their highlights there was that those blocks then would make a stakeholder or uh, a group that is cryptographically protecting that liable and potentially uh, 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 creating another honeypot or another you know uh, method of less interoperability and more uh, complexity, which is, is why there's some concerns there. Uh, there are also some uh, risks as well. They, they mentioned environmental um, type of hazards of blockchain and the energy compute and all those things, which I think that's a myth we've all kind of dove down a little bit as well. But um, there's some key uh, limitations I mentioned and ethical concerns. But at the end, they said they're uh, due to implementation of blockchain technology in the healthcare system that there would be uh, a little bit more transparency, decentralized trust as architectures that could be promising for some of these use cases. Um, the, the deep dive was more so on cryptography and more so on uh, the decentralized type of exchanges, like creating a DEX in a way uh, for this type of information. So uh, could be potentially valuable. If you wanted to learn more about the topic, that link is there. But has anyone else taken a, a read at this one? From the global blockchain initiative i started browsing through it a little bit uh i thought it was interesting the organ transplant section for uh use case i don't personally that's something i haven't really thought about too much so yeah and tracking and tracing of organ transplants and, and being able to have a, a decentralized distributed um record of how those they're transit transacted and transported mm -hmm. Awesome, cool. It was de definitely a deep read and I was excited to take, I took only an hour to it. I was, I was lazy and <laughs> didn't get that much time to do it, but. There, there are types of insurance that will cover the, the risks involved. I, can you tell me more about other kinds of insurance or the risks? Uh, type like mutual funds compared to, uh, compared to individual pooling of risk and things like that? Elizabeth, I can also answer that question on behalf of First IQ. Um, First IQ as a software as a software as a service provider is uh, required by many of our healthcare vendors to carry cybersecurity insurance. And uh, as those of you who have been seeing all of the cyber attacks have known that our cybersecurity insurance has gone through the roof. I think our premiums just skyrocketed this year. So um, yeah, uh, many blockchain providers are required now to, to maintain cybersecurity insurance as well. How does the, the blockchain um, premiums versus regular databases, is there any difference? You know, I, I, I don't know how the insurance companies make a, a determination about the premium costs and the risks. Um, all I know is as a software as a service that we do maintain some of the storage of health information. And so we are, our customers and clients have asked us to, well, actually required us to maintain cybersecurity insurance so that if there would be a breach of any aspect of our technology that we would help them using our cybersecurity insurance cover the customer or client's costs in dealing with the breach. So this is part of the cost of doing business in blockchain for healthcare too. And in many industries is that, you know, if we as service providers are responsible for some aspect of the business functioning and there's a disruption, we may be asked to bear some of the costs. So it's all worth, worth considering as we are involved in this space. Yeah, I can say from our perspective too in managing a <clears throat> blockchain consortia is we actually had to get another third party. We're all health insurance companies, but we had to get a third party to do the evaluation of, of who's taking what risk and what um, and uh, who's going to be the steward of that data, right? Um, I, I, your question originally, Mike, was what are the differences between blockchain and compared to regular ones is there's just so many more multi-parties and multi-stakeholders that 
when the request of a transaction distributed ledger is being accessed and if that <clears throat> if the maintainer and the operator of that transaction then is held liable for disrupting or disturbing the analysis or the transaction flow of the network they could be held liable and then all transactions they were connected to are then liable too but a lot of times instead of having to audit and go to each individual multi-party to to see what the the burden is or the burden of risk is you then have a more clean audit trail and you can find the discrepancy between the multi-parties a little bit easier through blockchain technology and so it you do have to pay a little bit more for the security prowess and the security auditing but in the end the reporting mechanism is a lot uh, faster in the end at least that's what i've seen so far Uh, and Elizabeth, you mentioned about validating false credentials. Uh, I haven't experienced anything of a network validating credentials. Uh, that's more of a, a group from ProCredX that could probably answer that question. But that is certainly something I would be interested in learning about more too. I've only handled and saw it from false data claims. Anyone else want to chime in on the topic? All right, cool. Thank you for your input. There was another research paper that came out from JMIR on potential uses of blockchain technology of out for outcomes on opioids. And I think a lot of this is uh, related to using blockchain for rewards and mechanisms of, behavior, of digital therapeutics. And uh, some of the abstract in this paper really highlighted on the effectiveness of blockchain to transmit information, and showcase information between multi-parties. And they found that clinical trial research, supply chain management, and secondary use of data had the most examples of practice to create better effectiveness of blockchain. So bringing in multi-sets of data to create a, a single event stream on a person and make that easier to be able to learn and to be able to uh, reposit data towards than traditional systems and the way we do this in web 2.0 type of methodologies. Uh, did anyone else have any um, uh, topics or things from this research that stood out to them? or have any opinions on the, the research as, as a whole. It was interesting hey, to know, oh, go ahead. Now I, I general, uh, you know, I have, uh, uh, you know, our com my company has built a few applications on blockchain and one of the, uh, you know, nice things is of course the decentralization, the immutability of the data. But one of the risks is also, even if you encrypt data, if it is personal information and you encrypt data and put it in a blockchain because of the nature of the immutability of the blockchain records and as encryption technology gets broken, thanks to, you know, we all know about uh, you know, the, that many of the algorithms are continuously being attacked and quantum computing someday might defeat even our most favorite RSA and so on and so forth. You know, the whole idea of public private key cryptography. So the question remains as to, is it a good idea to leave, for example, uh, critical health data in a blockchain, in, even if it's encrypted, because someday it might become available um, to be able to break it, right? So that's, a, I think, an important question to consider. So one of the ideas that, that uh, I have been kind of exploring, you know, in my organization, uh, and we are trying to build something is to, the ultimate answer might be wallets, right? Uh, good, uh, easily usable wallets. Now we have new techniques such as threshold uh, cryptography and others, you know, how wallets are 
really painful to manage for an average user. And that's the reason why wallets are left at Coinbase and, you know, people hack them and, you know, I mean, all this kind of stuff. But if there is good ways with good cryptography that you can secure your records either in a cloud wallet or some wallet which, uh, you know, you have good control of and the chance of losing your private key is low because we have new cryptographic techniques. That may be the area that might help us uh, truly make your health data uh, available to just you. And quite frankly, um, almost if you, you can then think of this whole distributed model of computing, right? For example, everybody owns their own data in some kind of a wallet. And, uh, you know, then negotiations are done by bots which can anonymize this data and give it to a provider or a you know, payer. Uh, in other words, uh, the data sits uh, spread across uh, available to each person. And then the compute model is going to run around and pick the data that is needed. Uh, of course, seeking your permission. Uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of an end state that I often think of. I don't know how feasible it is to make that work, but that may be the answer in my mind to this, uh, you know, I, I would think quite a big risk that uh, we are putting all these Im so-called immutable records and they kind of uh, could be, uh, you know, broken at some point in time. Anyway, that's just my opinion. So just wanted to bring that up. And, and Mahesh, that sounds great. So I want to be very positive and supportive. Um, up until the point that I tell you 49 out of 50 states say that the EHR owner is the owner of the data in it and that our legal constructs, either at a state level or at a federal level, don't really allow for a patient to own their own healthcare data. They obviously under the Cures Act have full legal um, empowerment to share it, um, sure. but, but ownership still resides with the healthcare system. That's a yeah. good point, Jim. And I think the this whole... Uh, it probably extends to almost every domain, right? In, in, in this case, uh, thanks for that clarification in terms of health data. Uh, if you think about all sorts of PII data, right, across the board, uh, I think we are in various stages of who owns it type of a question. I, like you said, in healthcare, it, uh, you know, it's, it's already uh, the way it is, like you point out. But uh, yeah, I think there is a larger debate as to how do we solve this lot, this problem of personal data and you know all the other things that we face. And uh, I know we are always actively debating here in the Linux Foundation with newer concepts from verifiable credentials to you know all the things we do. So uh, yeah, it's going to be a continual um, uh, you know kind of a debate, I'm sure. Uh, as we go along this journey. Mahesh, I, I wanted to ask you, um, the, you'd made the comment about uh, the data being in an immutable record and the potential down the road for it to be, uh, you know, if we, the encryption could be broken, wouldn't, if, if at that point, wouldn't it, the encryption of a wallet also be vulnerable? Wouldn't all of our systems be vulnerable at that point? You, you bring up a great point, Jordan. But the advantage of wallets is that the one of the first requirements of a good wallet is interoperability, right? So we should be mm. able, unlike uh, you know an immutable ledger, a wallet, you know, literally like our own wallets, you know, it goes bad after some time. You know, our physical wallets, we chuck it, yeah. <laughs> we take everything out of it, put it into a new wallet, nice and shiny. You got it for your birthday, and uh, you use it for the next day. So that's the advantage. Is uh, you know, again, this is this, you know, if it is, to me, the, the question is the record which is put on the ledger, right? Uh, even the technology, for example, Bitcoin and others are well aware of the problem of, uh, you know, lack of quantum resistance to some of the current elliptic key cryptography. But mm. uh, what will happen is, you know, again, remember, we, we use wallets to sign, we can change that technology, right? The wallet technology can be changed. So basically, mm -hmm. the public private key uh, stuff, you know, like, for example, right now, we have quantum resistant uh, cryptography uh, called uh, super singular isogeny, you know, key encapsulation mm -hmm. and Diffie Hellman. These are new techniques, even the NIST has published a recent paper uh, about it. So they are constantly coming up with it. 
so the cryptography of the wallet can be changed uh, Interesting. with no you know i mean yes we need to find some way to export and import it but uh, you know we cannot uh, change the once encrypted and stored record right that part uh, you know literally you know is is always available to somebody especially in public ledgers private ledgers i guess we can all collectively decide if there is a, a private ledger in the sense that it is a set of organizations i guess we could all collectively upgrade everything and uh, all promise to delete everything right so uh, i mean just get rid of the whole blockchain and recreate it with new technology right so uh, those are all not but but the idea is to use public chains or you know quasi public uh, uh, blockchains. Then it becomes very difficult because people have copies of it, uh, mm. and uh, they could use it or misuse it for uh, other purposes. Really interesting. Thanks for answering the question, um, <clears throat> Jim. I, I also wanted to ask you about your comment uh, about data ownership. Um, I hear different things from different people about who owns, about patients owning their data, hospitals owning the data, EHR vendors owning the data. I was under the impression that by that by HIPAA, the patient is the owner of the data and the hospital is the steward of the data. But I maybe I'm wrong on that. I'm interested. I see everybody unmuting. I'm interested yeah. to hear everyone's <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> I um I I refuse. Jim, you refuse? <laughs> oh, of course, his big point. He has yeah, right. <laughs> Zoom pulled the rug out from under him. Anyone else want to go? I have a, I have a statement on that as well. Uh, I, was just, I was just confused as far as the ownership, right? So if, if you share, if the provider shares it with the, with the patient, how do you, what do you identify as ownership at that point? If they so have the ownership... The ownership, and my, Doug probably has some thoughts on this too. The ownership is when who actually enters in the, the data to the portal or platform or application, that is the original owner. So like when you use terms and agreements and conditions like with Epic or some of those other platforms, uh, yeah, the covered entity owns the data. And so Epic is liable and is the covered entity of, of hosting that but it is then the hospital that is inputting the information. So it's most of the times the hospital that is responsible. And secondarily, then it's the platform, which is like Epic. And then thirdly, it, the patient is never held liable because you don't want to have people liable for things that they may not have like full control or understanding of because most of the population doesn't understand clinical data, how it's being used, wh why it's being transacted, transmitted. And uh and that's where the, the most of the liability lies. Doug, do you have a comment on this, sir? Uh, well, sure. I mean, we could go into a much deeper philosophical conversation going back to Larry Lessig or even the, the double spin problem that the blockchain itself was designed to address. Um, but without even going that far, the, um, you know, there's an important nuance between um, ownership and having and having rights to and um, the problem or the double spin problem I was alluding to is information has this unusual quality of, of when it's shared it's it's not uh, conveyed that is when when, when a patient uh, acquires their information from an EHR which they have full rights to do with very limited, but some restriction, um, they can do anything they want with it. However, the same information contained within the EHR is heavily restricted and regulated. So who owns it? I mean, it's a practical matter. Mm -hmm. They both own it. As a, as, a, as a further practical matter, the patient has more ability to use it in any way they please than the EHR. So it's a, you know, it's an interesting discussion i mean the the legal the statutory uh treatment of information is problematic throughout um you know whether you get digital rights management legislation and whatnot have, have chronically failed 
you know, to handle that problem of, of replicated, you know, dual, multi-held uh, information. So I guess where I come down on it is, you know, you can make a legal argument that the EHR has lots of um, responsibilities, custodial responsibilities, um, and have, have some rights to use the information subject to HIPAA and other things. The patient has virtually access to all the information without the restrictions. So I would say that as a walking around matter, the patient owns the data or has the data. Yeah, and, and I won't call that an incorrect uh, su summary, but I'll simply say that with the exception of live free or die New Hampshire, every <laughs> state has it codified that, uh, uh, that the EHR system owns the data. And, and, and I will agree with you, Doug, with regards to what we might consider ownership by default by the patient. But remember, at the end of the day, especially now that they've had to pass the information blocking rule, um, if a healthcare system just says, we're not going to give you access to your stuff, they're not going to give you access to your stuff. And, and you have to sue them or file a complaint with OCR or stomp your feet and wave your hands in the air. But, but either way, um, you don't have access to your data. So, so the law now allows you to correct it, provided the healthcare system does it. The law allows you to share it, provided the healthcare system does it. You know, if the healthcare system says we're going to give it to you on a DVD and you have to like it that way, then you have to like it that way and you can complain about it again as, a, as, as electronic sharing. But, but the healthcare system, by virtue of the fact that healthcare systems have separate liabilities with regards to providing care and managing care, which they are not excused from if they extend you, quote unquote, ownership of the data, then that's it. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's something of a conundrum, but. This is Wendy. Um, um, I just wanted to uh, um, augment the discussion. I think that we're, what happens is that we get the terminology conflated. Um, I really appreciate Jim's, Jim Sin, um, Sinclair's points dead on. Ownership is a legal construct. And what we really mean is control, which is an ethical con uh, construct. Uh, legally, Jim is totally right on about what the state laws specify and that HIPAA has no, no consideration at all for ownership of data for patients. Patients really only have the legal rights that he had mentioned pertaining to um, privacy, viewing and accessing their information, getting copies and requesting changes, but they do not have any legal rights for um, even deleting their information because state statutes specify the nece necessity for continuity of care. We also provide repositories. I think Mike Pika um, put a note in there too. Um, we do that for uh, academic organizations, life sciences organizations to allow patients more control of their information of how it's used for future uses. Um, but the pharmaceutical company always owns the data. Um, unless they create a new legal construct for their situation. So thanks. Thanks for clarifying all that for me, everyone. That was really helpful. Very helpful, everyone. And uh, I know we went down a rabbit hole of data ownership, um, <laughs> but I think it's very useful for everyone uh, to, to hash these together. Uh, in particular, I found these use cases very valuable. So if you want to be able to understand or learn more about how uh, blockchain applications can help in opioid research challenges. This is just research. This isn't in um, stopping anyone from using opioids or anything like that. This is just on the research and the challenges of access of information, distribution of goods, et cetera. Uh, so highly encourage anyone to take a look at that research. And, and to answer and to answer Elizabeth's question, there is no consent revocation model. Um, in fact, to, to, to Mike's point, the issue of consent around CFR Part Two data, which is what opioid use or misuse falls under, it is a whole other kettle of fish. But it's exciting. There's a couple projects: Project Unify, PP2PI, Leap, a few others that I'm involved with on the healthcare side that don't currently involve either blockchain or identity. But I'm working on that. <laughs> and those are trying to address different consent sharing models, which again, vary on a state-by-state -state basis. Great coverage, everyone. As always, we have the best experts in this field, for sure, that come to this 
bi-weekly meeting or every two week meeting. Awesome. So uh, one I wanted to also highlight Mike Pika's uh, recent post on LinkedIn uh, advocating for open science DAOs. And if you want to be able to go to the link, here it is as well. But uh, Mike, would you wanna summarize it up for us best? Sure. And uh, yeah, most of this, um, the thinking comes from uh, Sean Mannion's book, uh, Blockchain uh, Medical Research. Um, what he, he gets into is like one of the, the main problems with the, with, is the PhD system. We have like a growing amount of PhD candidates and only a limited amount of uh, professorship and PI roles. So they have to complete, compete on publications to kind of get ahead, which leads to uh, bad science and the fear of like uh, getting scooped, basically someone publishing your results before you can, um, makes it so you don't share ideas and creates a lot of duplicate work. The thinking is we can put it on the, the blockchain, you can prove, uh, prove ownership and then freely uh, collaborate. And this forms like a, a gig science economy where you work part-time in a few other areas of resource. You don't have to stick to what you're uh, currently doing. And then it gives them like an alternate uh, career route. So instead of just being like, just in the lab the whole time being underpaid and over, over educated, you can work on other things to, to get ahead. So we're thinking that you'll have a lot of DAOs form from this. Uh, one thing we discussed uh, last, last time we met is uh, the, the molecule organization doing the first uh, IP as an NFT. So they can get like DAOs, um, like Metallics and Aubrey's um, Vita DAO on longevity. Those types of things can form. You can introduce uh, more people into the profession um, instead of working on central and centralized labs that uh, require credentials. Thinking is you can innovate a lot faster and not be held to um, in institutions that are starting to uh, cause a lot of problems. Very well said, very well said. And uh, we had a presentation, I think before you joined us more frequently from Patrick from uh, Research Hub, which is a Coinbase sponsored project that solves this exact problem of there are too many, too many PhDs track students that do have talent, but don't actually get incentivized the right way as they should. Uh, it's a decentralized marketplace where you can reimburse others in uh, uh, hub tokens, I believe they're called for their type of research. So I highly suggest you check out Research Hub. And if you want the contact with Patrick, uh, please reach out to me separately, Mike. I think it's a, a yeah, connection you two could have. Thank you. What would you say it was Hub Research? Research Hub, Research Hub. Research. Thank you. Um, uh, Doug, you mentioned relying lagging state level statutes or something else. Oh, okay. About state block. Okay. Any questions for on Mike's topic and his presentation? I think I'd this like is awesome. Which, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah. Which longevity project are you interested in? I'm going to put one another one in the chat. We've uh, mentioned Vita Dow um, by Molecule a bunch of times in the group. And I think that's the one he's mentioning mm -hmm. is uh, the longevity one that we're all fairly familiar with. If I do a search on the word molecule, it'll come up. If you search it's molecule that I know I can, I can put it in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, on to our next topic. And this is um, for Wendy. Hopefully she's on her computer now. And uh, she recently yes. with PECB Insights was able to add a chapter in for uh, the alliance between AI and blockchain. In particular, her page covers blockchain innovations in healthcare. If you could recap that for us, that'd be very helpful. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. I, I was honored to be asked by this magazine to contribute a, a little article. So what their focus was, was uh, asking about some, oh yes, there it is, some real world examples of how blockchain and AI are creating innovations in healthcare. And so what I did is I shared some of the experiences that we had done at Burst IQ. The primary goal of this article is not just to talk about benefits 
in theory, but to talk about benefits in practice and educate the community that many of these components are not just in their infancy, that they have been implemented, that they are making a difference today. Um, blockchain in healthcare is today. And so we hope that um, this is more of a user accessible article that, um, you know, we all in the blockchain community can use as a reference if people want to know if there's something being done today. So I am eager for your questions too. Hi, Wendy. Um, I read this article and it was really fascinating. I enjoyed it um, immensely. Thank you for writing it. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with blockchain technology. I've done a lot of research to understand the mechanisms behind, behind the scenes. Um, and you talk about the difference between private and public um, blockchains and how that distinction has become kind of obsolete. Yeah. I'd like to better understand, you mentioned permission, permissioned blockchains. I'm very interested yeah. to understand this concept a, a little bit better. Yeah, so the nuance- Wendy, Wendy, real quick, could you uh, either uh, have your mic closer to your, we can't hear you as well. Oh, let me see if I can increase my volume. Okay. It might take me a second to do that. Otherwise, what I can do is, uh, Let's try this. Is that perfect? Better? Perfect. Okay, good. Um, okay, so so think about how the first the the first blockchains in the modern era, and I always call it the modern era because there was an earlier phase of blockchain like activity in 1991 where there was attestation and proof of evidence of documents and activities. So in the modern era, more organizations are familiar with the mechanisms for cryptocurrency, which became both public and permissionless. But then um, over time, then we're seeing <clears throat> private consortia and hybrid situations. But the permissioning has also evolved. So think about how now with Ethereum, which is probably one of the most popular public blockchains used as an underlying infrastructure for a wide range of industries that they now have permissioned modules. So think about private Ethereum and Ethereum Enterprise, which allow for some permissioning for access. There's also a hybrid permissioning structure where some organizations have set it up where everyone in the world can read information, but only certain organizations can write information. So what we're seeing is just um, a blurring of the lines that we previously had recognized and we're seeing more flexibility as organizations are developing new products in order to make those products better meet needs of industries. You know, th these permissions are uh, granted through the network uh, as a, like who governs the permission structure? It sounds like, this is a common co concept that comes up when people have their, their thinking really grounded in public blockchains. So as the private blockchains have moved forward, the governance structures are, are different than what you might be used to where they've had to centralize some features. And I know that centralization is anathema to some, some people in the blockchain community, but the reality is that organizations are, are doing this and to um, imposing more controls for access permissions, like in a consortia blockchain or a private blockchain, for example, they are supported by the organizations using it. And so they determine rules of governance for how the blockchain is maintained and accessed and what mechanisms they want for privacy and oversight. Um, for blockchains used in healthcare and life sciences, they have to meet all the regulatory requirements, including having antivirus and firewalls and, and specific audit trails that um, go beyond what a blockchain would normally do. Those activities do require some centralization. And so for those of, I don't know if any of you are on the IEEE governance uh, committee, but this is something that we have been struggling with and trying to create awareness of how governance itself is evolving 
over the different types of emerging technologies that fall under distributed ledger technologies and create guidelines and standards for how we can think about governance differently, how we can think about all of these related underlying structures differently and best create a technology that meets industry's needs. It seems to me that uh, I, I hear a lot of um, there are a lot of evangelists out there that are you know, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain it has to be, you know, block. we have to leave, you know, web 2.0 completely behind. And it seems to me more and more that really there's an important mix of some of these web 2.0, web 3.0 features. So, you know, the blockchain with, you know, features like you're describing some of the centralization uh, and old, you know, and becoming antiquated technologies. Is that uh, is, is that do you agree with that do you feel like that's true so personally i'm not going to take so a position a on what is the right definition i serve on committees that are agonizing over creating definitions and there is no solid consensus the only thing that we can do is be aware and recognize that organizations within the blockchain community are using blockchain in new ways. And so these are really gonna become market-driven forces and market-driven definitions. And so it's just that we have remain awareness and of how the terms are being used, how the technology is being used and recognize that it will continue to evolve based on market needs. Interesting, thank you. Appreciate your, your comments and thoughts. Awesome. Any other questions for Wendy? I do want to try and move on. Uh, but any questions? Yeah, I, I do want to add I do want to add thirty seconds to uh, Wendy's outstanding summary and just say that a high level there's the biggest differentiation as she summarized is between decentralized processes and decentralized governance. Yeah. The religious zealots out there believe everything, including governance, is decentralized. But as Wendy captured very well. I can't convince HHS, DHS, and Department of Commerce to have a completely decentralized autonomous environment operated off of Bitcoin for various reasons. But that doesn't mean that processes that they share can't be decentralized and take advantage of decentralization as part of it. Totally agree. Totally agree. Awesome. So I think for the rest of our session, I did want to get to this, like what questions in the space do we want answered and what teams can help educate us on topics we want to learn more about. This is uh, one of two things I wanted to highlight here. Um, if I can edit real quick. One, I think it'd be valuable in the next coming months to have presentations from Jim's group at Lumetic, and then also uh, Wendy's group at First IQ, if they could help answer some of these questions or, or whatever topic or, or, or concept they believe is needs answering from their expertise or from their solutions, we'd love to have a presentation in the next coming months from either of you uh, to help educate us on more topics. Uh, and then we could talk about it offline too. I had some suggestions in my mind, but uh, we don't have enough time for that today. Uh, the rest of the session, um, also, I want to get your permission to do that too, not just put you on the spot. But I think that'd be valuable for the group as well. Then I'd, I'd like us to review for the rest of the time here. We may not be able to get to it or we may be able to. Uh, we have these blockchain use cases we have here um, within the use case development group. Uh, give me a second, it's loading. So we put this together last, I believe it was April or March. And I wanna take every six months to review these. I think there's new opportunities and new use cases we could probably put down around the NFT and ownership space. But generally this is the, uh, I'll put this in the chat too so everyone can access this themselves. Um, but generally these are the use cases I found to be applicable and meaningful in the healthcare space. Um, would love to hear uh, any others or any other use cases that I might not have on here that I should add because uh, or that we should add as a group. Mike, have, have um, I, I mean, it doesn't seem like we are necessarily in sync with Stephen Elliott, what he's doing for 
the Fabric healthcare team, maybe inviting him to present as well on the use case he's developing. He meets on, he has his meeting on uh, Monday mornings. Great point. Anything else from the use cases in particular? So clinical trials, so clinical trial management, would that be recruitment during blockchain or is this, uh, do we, am I not covering more so like the different uh, situations of how blockchain can help clinical trials? I guess I'm not really doing that. Uh, do you already have uh, fine green consent or consent management generally in one of these? Consent. No, he doesn't. That's a that's a good addition. Yeah, you're right. So, I'm gonna yeah, to and add mind. Doug to. I'm gonna I'm going to volunteer to add Doug to the agenda because I think that their platform, um, from a from a decentralized perspective, is about the most dis, uh, sophisticated decentralized consent management approach. Why? Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a differentiation from Lumetic, where we're focused as part of the decentralized identity community with a healthcare application yeah. that's different than a consent yeah. management flow. No, well, I'll return the favor or the compliment that Lumetic is the most advanced on the uh, identity piece of decentralized healthcare. Oh, guys, we're getting along. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. We should merge. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you just got acquired. You can't do right. that it's a little late now to have that conversation. I'm kidding. Consent management, definitely. Um, this is something Health Verity does as well. I think I had something around them, though, that I only mentioned that they're part of uh, something else. Oh, yeah. Patient identity and ownership. Yeah, I did have consent management on here for that. Um, yeah, there it is. Okay. It's a broad scope, though. I should have Fireblocks onto that though. Well, go ahead and put Evernim in there. Yeah. Evernim doesn't have a consent management. It doesn't, doesn't oh. have a consent management. So. But is that sovereign or? No, well, I mean, Evernim is its own company. Yeah. And yeah. Sovereign, doesn't, sovereign doesn't enable consent management either. All right. Is I think there is an opportunity for the NFT stuff. Uh, I would even call that separately instead of just genomic tracking, like NFTs for health charity or causes. That's definitely something that's become mainstream. So, hey guys, I got a eleven o'clock hard stop. I'm gonna have to run. No worries, um, and that's why I don't know if this is uh if this is enough time to get into this but i think for our next sync i want to highlight some projects we want to help present to us in the future uh these are three and i'll talk to wendy and and uh jim offline in particular and we love and love to have uh doug from fireblocks give a presentation as well and an update on what Firebox is doing if you're allowed to do so I know acquisitions may make that rough, but uh, um, cool. Uh, if anyone else has suggestions too, feel free to message me or you have my email uh, that comes in every week. Feel free to leave a suggestion there. But uh, are there any other questions or updates someone would like to mention before we have one minute left? It's a great awesome. discussion, everyone. I always learn from this group. So thank you for all of your wise comments and questions. So lively. I can say the same. Everyone's very smart and we're all very humble and intelligent and everything. So uh, thank you all for the time. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. And remember, if you have any suggestions, feel free to email me, message me on LinkedIn uh, or on Rocket Chat too. We have Rocket Chat as well. So um, Nobody uses Rocket Chat. It's this all is slack. true. We need to all get better at using Rocket Chat. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thank Mike. you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks, Mike.